Okay, so we start today with a confession of dumbassery on my part. Uh, if you remember uh, yesterday when we left off, I was testing this script, uh, which... Uh, okay, we were testing this script, okay, uh, which I've added this line to at the top to echo out the master IP. And when I was running it, I didn't seem to be getting a result. Uh, this was because I'm an idiot. <clears throat> I've called the, the the script test, if you recall, and I was running it like this, and not getting any result. Uh, and this is because, as I as I've just said, I'm an idiot. Test, if you recall, is a bash built-in uh, function. Uh, in fact, I think, uh, yeah, which checks things like file types and compares values. So the problem is that when you type test at the command line, that's what's actually being executed, is, th is that uh, function, uh, which is one of the uh, standard uh, available uh, uh, test functions. So what I should have been doing is dot slash test, which, was, which basically says uh, in the current directory, the thing called test. Okay, and then, oh look, I get the result I'm expecting. So, uh, the moral of this tale is as follows. Uh, first of all, don't call your scripts or functions the same things as system functions, uh, because you will get confused. And secondly, remember that dot, the current directory, is by default not on on your path, which is the uh, the list of uh, directories that will be searched for when you type in a command on the command line. Uh, now, one might be tempted to add uh, dot to your path. Don't. Uh, it's a really bad idea, generally, um, because First of all, uh, you can end up shadowing things that you don't really intend to. So you can mistakenly um, uh, end up with files or functions in your in your local directory uh, that will shadow things in later directories. And because your current directory is constantly changing as you move around the file system, you can end up in a right buggers model. So don't don't add dot to your dollar path. Uh, it's also a bad idea for uh, security reasons. Uh, if you've got a script, for example, that runs in part or in whole as a privileged user, uh, it's best to take complete control of path uh, in the script. Don't rely on the user supply exported path. Now, I'm the first to admit, I very seldom uh, take control of path, uh, largely because the scripts I and mostly involved in are going to run in privileged environments all the time. Uh, they're not intended for users to run. Users generally won't have access to them, so uh, there's not really an issue because, you know, but uh, they are effectively uh, in a controlled environment all the time. If, however, you've got a script which is ever uh, elevating a user's privileges uh, uh, and is intended to do so, under no circumstances should you rely on path. <clears throat> okay. Uh, right. Uh, so with that said, uh, we've now got a test uh, script which seems to be doing what it should do. Um, so if we now cat TST, which is our test file, you can see we're now getting one two three four five, which we define as our master IP, and we've got the salt added on the end of it. Uh, if we get rid of that line and then. Uh, run the script again. Okay, and now, uh, now we've got one, two, three, four, five salt added to the end. Uh, and if we look at, uh, if we look at the test, you'll see that what's happening is we've got three expressions. One which says, if you find a line that contains salt, just consume the rest of the file. Okay, uh, just loop round next file, next file, next file, and consume the entire file. If you find a line which contains the master IP, then you basically add salt to the end of that line. Okay, now really, 
Uh, if you wanted to be really, really strict, you'd want master IP and not salt anywhere on the end of it. But of course, this one will always match first. So if it's already got salt defined, you, you'll have consumed the rest of the file anyway. So this is generally harmless. Uh, finally, and this is the one we've just invoked, if you match the end of the file, You'll notice the backslash here because this has got double quotes around it to allow the master IP to be expanded. Uh, so if it matches the end of the file, which is dollar in said terminology, then append uh, A, and it appends the line which consists of the expanded master IP and so on. Okay, so we've got those three cases. Uh, if we just, uh, again, Look at our TST. Okay, if we edit that TST file and we can move that line somewhere else in the file uh, just to demonstrate that we're actually working. So if we now run it again, okay, you can see that line's unaffected. Basically, the first rule is matched. We've got salt and we've just printed out the rest of the file. So let's take the final case, which is where we've got the IP address. But it doesn't have, in fact, let's make it more challenging. So we've got this defined as, let's say, localhost. Okay, and we now run test. Okay, and the test file now consists of 12345, which is our master IP, the localhost, which was the line as it was originally, with salt appended to the end. Okay, so we're in pretty good shape with test. Now, looking at this file, um, oops, okay. uh, looking at that file, you can see it's a, it's a bit long-winded. The return characters in this string are necessary, uh, uh, but only because of the way we're formatting the uh, set commands. If we look at uh, test one, which is a more refined version, You'll notice that it's somewhat more compressed. Okay, we've only got one expression for a start, and the expression is the entire script. Uh, we've still got the same three matching rules, but we've removed all of the blank spacing, and we've removed all of the return characters from within each of the uh, match expression rules. Okay, uh, I've also abbreviated loop to just L. Okay, so we've got essentially not quite the most condensed we could for example end each of these expressions with a semicolon and join them all together get rid of the spaces completely uh, but i think this is slightly more readable uh, if we now look at uh, down here which is what i'm actually going to add to my script you'll notice a couple of things first of all i've added some spaces around these uh, inside these braces uh, which I think reads slightly better, uh, even given the compressed nature of these expressions. So, th these expressions, by the way, are so brief uh, and, and so trivial that it's not worth making them more sophisticated. If you can read said, you could read those expressions straightforwardly. I think if they were long expressions, more complex expressions, I'd be inclined to separate them out and make them look more like a script. In fact, I may even put them in a script file and use minus F rather than passing directly. Uh, the other thing I've done is I've, exp I've separated the expressions from the commands to be executed uh, with a space, which again I think reads slightly better um, than than leaving them uh, as is. I mean, it, I suppose I could do this and actually have all of the expressions lined up. Yeah. But, I don't see a huge amount of value in that. Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe not. Anyway, so yes, so I think that is about as condensed an expression while leaving it readable within the script. Mm -hmm. Sure, we can make it more condensed. We can, yeah, we can, we can compress it even more. But there's always a trade-off with these things uh, between uh, uh, readability and you know conciseness. Uh, as I say, if these expressions, uh, if these expressions, these loop expressions, were any more uh, uh, complicated, I, I would certainly make them into full scripts. Okay, so I think with that commentary out of the way, uh, uh, I think we're done here. So let's uh, remove test. 
test one and TST. Uh, so we're done with those. Uh, we don't need this shell anymore. Uh, right. Okay. Uh, yeah, so that's made our, our script somewhat uh, better. Now, just going back and revising again, this is the server bootstrap script, if you recall, uh, and we're always adding on uh, a specific IP address to salt mapping so that the uh, fully quality or the, the host name salt is always resolving to our master IP in this script. Okay. And our master IP is the third parameter being passed in. Now, why do we do that? Uh, because at the time that we're running these bootstrap scripts, we're not guaranteed to have a name server online, which will be able to tell everybody where the salt master is. So we, we do it explicitly. Um, but by default, uh, uh, it, uh, um, salt is the expected location now we could specify on the command line we could specify a different salt master name but why bother uh, unless you've got a compelling reason to change it uh, i would just leave it as salt if your infrastructure demands a very specific name for your servers um, and, and the services and the, the, the domain names and, um, and the fully, fully qualified names that uh, uh, are set then obviously you'll need to uh, you'll need to change the way that works uh, in which case I believe uh, on the bootstrap strip uh, you can specify uh, dun, 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 dun. Mm -mm -mm. Here we go. Okay, so you can pass the Saltmaster's DS name or IP address, okay, which will then be stored explicitly uh, within your uh, minion. So that's the alternative way of doing it. Uh, uh, generally speaking, I favor, obviously, because I've done it, I favor this method. Uh, because then everything is consistent okay it's all defaulting to the name salt uh, we resolve it locally for the one or two machines that absolutely need it uh, and then once we've got our uh, name services started up which by the way we're going to be running on our router box our, our network server if you will um, so we're going to be running the uh, name services a part of that machine uh, so that machine obviously has to have it set because it, it won't be running at the time we first run salt uh, and our server needs it running because at the time we build the master there's no NASA name service available those should be the only two machines ever that, that really need it <clears throat> um, but again it depends on your on, on the build out sequence of exactly how you're building out your system but we'll, we'll, we'll get there okay uh, then uh, these three lines are just needed to execute the, the salt bootstrap put salt on the machine after that we're done okay <clears throat> now then uh, the other script this one uh, down here okay uh, this one uh, is uh, sorry that's the, uh, the that's the vagrant file and we've added uh, this script here uh, which is the accept minion script okay uh, and do I have that already oh I don't hmm. okay uh, this is the uh, uh, so this is only ever run on the master uh, okay so this one only ever runs on the master and it takes in as its input uh, a list of minion IDs and then it just loops over that list and it does the operation of uh, wait checking and waiting 
uh, whether those are uh, whether the certificates have arrived in this minion's pre directory. Um, <clears throat> if they have, uh, then we just accept immediately. Failing that, we go into this loop where we wait. Now, by the time this is run, which is at the end of the master, okay, we should be in good shape and uh, 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 we should be, yeah, we should be in good shape, and all of those minions will already have reported uh, to the to the sort master. Okay, uh, there might be a slight delay uh, on the basis that uh, the minions will uh, will have been polling for a given period of time, uh, and I believe, if memory serves, there is a backup function, so. They poll fairly frequently, and then they gradually get slower and slower, uh, trying to get their keys um, accepted. Uh, but in the timescales we're talking about, it's probably not going to be an issue. Now, um, all right. Uh, okay. Uh, right, so we looked uh, yesterday at the at the more complicated script. Uh, which was the, uh, yeah, which was, um, oh, now then, where was it? Um, Uh, right, I think this is the one. Yeah, this is the one. Okay, and, th and this took a slightly different approach. Now, what we did do was we did things like parameterize the uh, the salt version that we were going to install and stuff like that. Uh, so we will look at that. Um, we also were providing for both VMware Fusion and VirtualBox. Okay, we're not going to do that for now. Uh, we're, we're going to assume everybody's using VirtualBox because that's all this is set up for. Uh, so what we want to do now is uh, we'll just ignore all of this stuff temporarily. Okay, and we're going to do this. We're going to define our first uh, our we're going to define our uh, virtual machine. Okay, so in, whereas this was we're configuring the default machine, you know, the, 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 it was the, it's the highest level of configuration. What we want to do is we want to configure dot vm, and then it's this define which is the important part. Okay, and we're going to define uh, server zero zero one. Okay, as being um, uh, our, our management server. Okay, uh, now primary tells Vagrant that this is, uh, it's the default machine to be used if we don't explicitly specify one on the command line. So when we type Vagrant SSH, for example, with, with no qualifier, it'll be this machine which we SSH into, which is perfect because 99 times out of 100 we want to go to the salt master. Uh, if you want explicitly to SSH into one of the other machines, you would type Vagrant SSH and then its name as defined in, in here. Uh, so in our case, uh, Vagrant SSH SRV001 would log us into the master as well. Okay, But by specifying the default to be the one that we're generally going to do, uh, Uh, it just makes life easier uh, when we come to uh, let's go on. It's not server one. Okay. Uh, and the main thing is that the uh, these four lines, uh, although I suppose uh, 
for a large to a large extent uh, that reload is probably going to be needed more than once however uh, Uh, and of course we need to change each of these configs to be uh, oops a bit of finger trouble uh, each of these configs wants to be changed to uh, SRV001 uh, so that uh, yeah, so that we're setting on for server one, we're setting these attributes. Uh, really, it, it, I mean, this one obviously has to be set on the server because it's got its IP address in there. This one obviously has to be set on the server because uh, it's got uh, the specifics of the server name, and it's also got the L and M uh, and the IP address. Um, uh, this one, uh, this one, we're going to have to do some some monkeying around with eventually because it has to include the names of all of the fully qualified domain names, of all of the servers which have been configured so far. So we're going to need to do something programmatic with that. Uh, and this one does the reload. Now, technically, uh, the reload is going to be done, I think, on every machine. If you remember, that makes sure that the, the new host name and things are picked up. And since that is set uh, by the main server bootstrap script, we are going to want to do that after each one. So uh, we'll need to consider whether that should also should actually be set on the config level or not. And for that, we're going to need to double check uh, what the execution sequence is between. Uh, config and server and I can't remember exactly what the rules are so uh, I believe you, if you're not doing this sort of thing you know day in day out uh, then the chances are that you're going to forget this kind of detail uh, I mean you might remember it uh, but the thing is why take up brain space on stuff you can just check from the few times that you're going to uh, look it up so uh, you're going to need it so uh, let's see configuration uh, this is the config namespace Does it? here we go load order emerging uh, Um, here we go. Right, so in this case, we'll output A, then C, then B. So and the output so that's the that's generic and that's generic so you can see that they're lexical but it's put out between a then c then b so in actual fact the more specific stuff gets done uh, yeah okay so the more specific stuff is scoped at runtime is scoped out of order uh, and all of the stuff at this top level is executed in lexical order, uh, the order in which it appears in the file. So, um, Mm-hmm. 
uh, oh this is the, this is basically the trick uh, that I use in that main script uh, or, uh, the one we were looking at earlier uh, now if you remember in 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 this script here uh, if we go to the end and then go, go back a couple of yeah, you can see uh, this is just a, a block of data which defines things like the fully qualified the fully qualified domain name what NICs we want how much memory and how many CPUs uh, and this list loops over a common definition block uh, that does all the magic of actually setting it up uh, and we may, we, in the long run we may do something just like this uh, but for now uh, for now we're going to uh, just define the two machines uh, so let's define okay so this is our second bootstrap machine uh, but if you remember we want to define it first uh, okay so we, we although we're although we're specifying it uh, although it's named two it's actually number one <laughs> Okay, so we want to, uh, yes, we want to do something similar to that. Okay. Uh, uh, but this time it's going to be 254 because it's uh, uh, obviously we don't want it to be the primary. Uh, why is that? That's very odd. Okay. Uh, uh, so we can't have two primaries, so we take that out. Oh, crying out loud. Um, uh, we still want to keep it all, this on the central net. Uh, and again, this would benefit from parameterization. We'll come on to that in a minute. Uh, right, so the shell. Uh, yes, we want the same shell basically. Okay. Uh, except, of course, all the parameters are going to be different. So uh, it's going to be server two. And again, we can we could we could have robbed. Um, Okay, so 254, and again, if we put parameters in, we'll find ourselves in a lot better shape. Uh, this fourth parameter, we don't want anything in that. Okay, uh, I'll leave these quotes in as a, as a placeholder, just to remind me that there is another parameter there. Uh, but obviously, uh, that's not really going to be passed in. Um, then uh, we don't want to run this, but what we do want to do is add uh, onto this loop uh, uh, we want to add on to this loop the fact that we're going to add server 002 dot plan one okay okay so that adds that that adds an acceptance of this server onto it okay and we will also uh, do the reload here Whoops! Uh, not having much trouble, not having much, much joy with my fingers today. Okay. Now this this reload is probably a little bit of a an overkill. Um, you know, it, it's not really necessary. Uh, we could we could get away without it, but for the sake of completeness, let's leave it in there. Okay. So what should happen now is we should find that server two is set up uh, salt is installed and the minion will immediately try to contact the salt master and find that it's not there but what it will then do is it will go into a cycle of attempting a few times to 
uh, get its certificate uh, onto the master. Uh, in the meantime, we set up the master. Eventually, it will get it, and hopefully, we end up accepting these two certificates. So, let's let's see what happens. Uh, let's do vagrant destroy. <clears throat> now, uh, this is something that I've screwed up myself several times, and that is, if you edit a vagrant file uh, while the machine is actually running. Uh, in this case, neither of them were running. If you edit a vagrant file while the machine is running, you will find that uh, if you've, for example, taken one of the machines out of the vagrant file, then you have vagrant destroy. That machine won't be destroyed because it's no longer in the vagrant file. So you'll end up with a, a weird sort of running machine. Um, or if you make a mistake in your vagrant file, uh, uh, the vagrant file will fail to load. And nothing will happen. Yeah, so uh, it's probably generally, unless you're messing around with provisioners uh, and you're going to run the vagrant up provisioned uh, uh, just to run the provisioners, um, it's probably best not to screw it. Oh, uh, actually, while we're here, <clears throat> another thing uh, if we um, do vagrant up. Uh, and then specify a particular machine, it, only that machine would, would be upped, as it were. Now, I think Vagrant by default will try to start these in, uh, in sequence. You can specify that it will try to start them up in parallel, in which case you get loads of interlaced messages, um, which I don't favour, especially in the in the circumstances like this, uh, where we would end up with all sorts of horrible race conditions. And what we really want is we want the server one to always be the last machine set up. Begs the question, actually, can we specify? Uh, Can I specify? Hmm. Where are we? Config multi machine. Uh, now then, if I. Uh, No, no. I thought there was a way of of getting them to set up in in parallel within the. Ah, doesn't it doesn't matter. It was just a thought. Right uh, now, it's it's going to take a while to cook these because obviously it's got to set up two uh, complete virtual screens, virtual screens, virtual machines from scratch. So, in the meantime, uh, let's think about some of the improvements we could make. Uh, uh, obviously, there, we, we could parameterize some of this. We could specify, for example, in the same way that we have done over here, we could specify server 1 and server 2 uh, using something like this, uh, along with the loops. Um, now, it's worthwhile when we get loads and loads and loads of machines, but when you've only got a couple, probably not worth it. Uh, and the truth of the matter is that with salt, once we start building things in the, in the cloud, um, there's really no point in uh, uh, defining a lot of vagrant boxes unless we want to test them locally and not as test cloud systems. Okay, because there's nothing to stop us uh, if we're working in the cloud other than the cost of your cloud service uh, setting up. Uh, a dozen cloud servers uh, and then tearing them down after you've done your testing. 
uh, which begs the question why bother having vagrant under those circumstances is not really what it's intended for. Uh, if, however, your cloud service costs you a lot of money or you know there are good reasons why you want to run them locally, for example, you're running disconnected a lot and you want to run them locally, uh, then, yeah, sure. Uh, in actual fact, this system here, which is described by this vagrant file, uh, was a cloud services. Um, and all of these servers, although they're defined here as part of the vagrant file, were ultimately were going to be uh, cloud services. Um, It all came to nothing in the end, but uh, that's the whole point about these, is to be able to do a proof of concept. Right. Um, what else? Um, okay, let's move that to a separate... Okay. Interesting. Uh, on the face of it, it looks like we've got an issue. Uh, right. Uh, while we're at it, Uh, mm. What we don't have in there is the automated response. Uh, so what we need to do is um, actually, we can make our lives a little bit easier. Um, uh, do I want to do it that way? Because there is actually a facility on the on the bootstrap salt. You can give it a parameter that uh, tells it to do an upgrade, uh, basically to do this this uh, these two commands before. Uh, it installs salt, uh, which in our in our case would, would be fine because we we're not doing anything important beforehand that requires it to be up to date. So we could actually get around this whole problem or issue. Uh, but no, uh, let's do the job properly. Mark, come on. So we've got inside Debian, uh, and now uh, I'm going to remember what. Come on. Uh, what's it called? Debian. Uh, it's not. Uh, is it Debian interface? Uh, and it's non-interactive. Is that right? Uh, you know. I see. Got a brain like a sieve some days. Uh, so, uh, Debian, blah blah blah, non interactive. Uh, Debian front end, that was it. Uh, okay. okay, so that'll, that'll prevent that uh, grub, uh, grub loader. 
Oh, error. And if we, and again, Okay, uh, so that will stop those stupid warnings about at. That will prevent any problems uh, where we're going to be prompted. Right, uh, let's try Vagrant up again. See how we go. Oh. It's not ideal, it's Derby. I'm sorry. It's all right, you can relax. It's getting very warm out, don't you know? Oh, poor sleepy kitty. Now, the fact that these machines take a, a long time to set up uh, is a bit of a hindrance. But uh, you, you're not going to be doing it in, in you know, once these are once this process is sorted out, 
the majority of our configuration will be done in a completely different way uh, using salt on server one so you know constantly destroying and rebuilding these machines is not something we're going to be doing a great deal it's a good idea uh, uh, it, you know even when we, once we've got things running smoothly it's a good idea to completely destroy and rebuild machines in order to make sure that you've got a completely clean uh, uh, build process for these but the overhead of you know hurry up and wait is largely eliminating you know once we've got them actually running uh, we don't have to do this a great deal uh, but it is it's a bit of a, it's a bit dull there is another way of doing it and that is to create a, uh, a, a box image the base box uh, which has already got the majority of this stuff installed so uh, we could in theory well not in theory we could in practice um, create for example a base minion box and a base master box which has already got salt installed and then the only configuration to be done would be uh, to configure its IP address and hosting and, and that would be really nice and quick uh, so uh, we may do that just as an exercise later um, it depends how often you expect this basic build to be done um, uh, if the answer to that, uh, the, the good thing is Packer will just basically be able to use the same setup scripts as we're using now. Uh, and, you know, we'd be good to go. That is to say, the server bootstrap script, um, you wouldn't need the uh, accept minions script, that would still have to be done by Vagrant because you don't know how many minions you're going to be setting up. Uh, the other thing to remember is that you would need to fix up your minion ID. Uh, but that's trivial because that's just a file within your slash etc slash salt directory called minion ID. Um, so once you'd started the packer box, you would set that minion ID and then restart the minion in order to have it uh, correct that. In fact, you could. Uh, I suppose the simplest way of doing it would be to not have the minion start as part of the packer box. Hmm. Uh, I got this delivered today, which is just a, a huge. The idea was I would just put this pointing down at my notebook as a sort of document camera. Uh, and then the course it claims, oh, I'll just plug it in, it'll work. Doesn't. But I've got to do a bit of debugging on that. Ah, Ever is the way with these things. Uh, the, these reboot, um, these reboots are another thing that we could do away with. I have to say, actually, it is a bit sluggish, aren't you? Mm. The computer is working overtime at the moment. What is this keeping it so busy? Agree. OBS is currently using 486%. It's using five, five processors all to itself. Brave Browser is using one of a bit. Item is using one of a bit. Windows servers using one, <laughs> uh, yeah, so even on uh, e even on this ridiculous bloody spec of a machine, uh, doing all the capture and uh, streaming is really kicking this machine. This, I suppose, is the advantage of having another machine actually doing the streaming. Does seem to be taking an awful lot out of it today. Uh, 
quite sure why. It's very odd. Hmm. Oh. I mean, OB, oh, oh, hello, we've got a problem. Time out while waiting for the machine to boot. Ooh! This means that Vagum was unable to commute with the code of the machine and configure to be on people. Okay. Uh, you should be able to see errors that Vagrant when it did. Well, we can't. Uh, it, it was. Uh, now, occasionally I've had trouble with this, and it's to do with. Uh, these mappings uh, and it's because vagrant's got itself in a bugger's model uh, which does happen from time to time so you can see server 2 is running so let's just try I think, I think it's just got itself in a pickle. All right, I would have expected to have connected by now. So let's have a look at for SSH depending on my product may carry different meanings. Alright. Mm. Mm. Okay. Oh now then I got it we're on. Okay, I can't be bothered. Mm. Let's go all the way back to the beginning. In fact, we can go back even further than just doing this. Okay. If you want to do a complete reset. Oh, I don't do that. Mm. We can get rid of everything and we can try the vagrant up again. Unfortunately, that does mean we have to wait for that rather tedious process again. Right, what should we do while we're waiting for that? Uh, let's have a look at salt. Right, um, so 
we've said uh, I said repeatedly uh, that we're going to use salt to do the configuration for this so uh, let's have a look at salt uh, Uh, let's have a look. Uh, they've changed their website since I was here last. Cool. Uh, this is the setup we're going to be. Uh, uh, we're going to be using, uh, which is the, uh, the the master, as it were, uh, and then the event bus with a series of agents, which are the minions. Um, we're also perhaps going to look at this one, which is uh, where you've got uh, 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 a, a, an appliance, uh, like for example a managed switch, which has got an API. Uh, but won't allow you to install one of these agents on it or isn't able to support one of these agents uh, you can you can set up what's called a proxy agent uh, and the proxy agent behaves exactly the same way as any other minion except for uh, it kind of bridges uh, between uh, salt and the device uh, or uh, application uh, appliance so uh, these two uh, broadly speaking the same thing the only difference is that this has got one extra level of indirection in it where uh, you've got a, effectively a, a sort of pseudo minion uh, that sits in between these two uh, so in between the real thing and uh, the salt stack master uh, what's it got in here uh, all the usual blowing of trumpet stuff that is largely irrelevant to us oh come on uh, right uh, we don't want the enterprise stuff salt open there you go that's the interesting one so this is uh, the open source version uh, the, di the differences are more to do I think to do with um, yeah, the level of support that's available. There are one or two things I think that are in the salt stack enterprise. Uh, uh, some nice uh, front end stuff. Uh, uh, there's a there's a there's a couple of uh, sort of web front end elements. Uh, blah blah blah. blah. Uh, Uh, but for our purposes, salt open is, is more than adequate. So, what have we got? Um, the salt open repository. Oh, yeah, that's an interesting point. Because it's open source, uh, you can actually you can literally build salt from scratch. Well, I say build it. It's a Python uh, environment, uh, a Python system. So, uh, how can I run a branch script from the master on a minion? Uh, well, you can load it up and use the script runner. Uh, okay, now there were some nice diagrams around here at one point. Uh, and I'm just... So, uh, it should be under support and services. You'd expect that uh, there would be documentation um, download and install instructions uh, critical vulnerability oh yeah there was a bit of a to do a while back about it having a major problem um, uh, funny is it's funny that the documentation isn't the front and centre, isn't it? Uh, 
Okay. In fact, hmm. it's all stuck. <clears throat> It's almost like they deliberately get in there. Mm, resources. There we go. Mm -hmm. There we go. There we go. God blimey. It's like it's like they've deliberately hidden it. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, how are we doing? Oh, it's waiting for the machine to boot again. This is, this is doing the reload. It kind of suggests that there's something going pear shaped about this, isn't it? It's obviously leaving the machine okay i wonder if there's something wrong with the reboot of, of this server for some reason can't imagine what unless uh, i mean it's possible it's possible there's something going wrong It's possible that something we've done is breaking the the reboot. Mm, let's just tell you what. There's an easy way of finding out. Uh, if we just take that line out for a moment. Okay, I take the reload out of the loop. Um, oh, I could be running foul. Uh, no. What if, I'm, what if I'm running foul of networking? It's possible. That's an interesting question. Uh, right. Uh, let's do. Oh, let's do it that way. Uh, I'm kind of curious now. Okay. Uh, right. Um, okay. So what we've got here, uh, and this is a, this is a great place to come, by the way, uh, DocSaltStack.com. Um, uh, it's it's rather unfortunate that SaltStack.com doesn't make it easier to get here. But uh, anyway, Docs.SaltStack.com uh, will give you everything you need to know. Uh, the main uh, things that people are interested in are configuration management. Okay, uh, that's kind of like what everybody goes on about, uh, and th that's the kind of Ansible chef puppet kind of stuff. Uh, then you've got the uh, assembly with remote execution, which is one of the good things. Remote execution modules allow you to do an awful lot of stuff that you would normally do with SSH. Uh, so you can avoid having SSH on the machine. You you can kind of set up a really cool system actually, uh, which uh, maybe we'll do it. 
using uh, it's actually using the Vault system. Uh, so no, uh, ignore that. Uh, but yeah, you can do remote execution, uh, which allows you to do 99% of the stuff that you would normally do with SSH if you're so inclined. Uh, then we've got this. Now this event-driven infrastructure. Okay, this allows you to do some really cool stuff. Uh, th this is the this is the stuff which allows you to do um, uh, sort of real-time monitoring of your infrastructure and allows it to kick off actions based on things that happen. So, for example, if a machine becomes unavailable, or if uh, you detect a file change that shouldn't be there, uh, things like that. Um, this allows you to report that back to the master, and for the master to then decide what it should do about that particular problem. Uh, so, uh, you know, if a file change, you probably want to rerun the salt state in order to reimpose the correct file. Uh, uh, and at the same time, you'd want to alert an operator that something had gone pear-shaped. Um, when you've got Vault installed, you, you could, in theory, uh, although whether it's a good idea or not doesn't matter, you could, in theory, have a system where uh, if you detect particular intrusions into your system, uh, that it automatically would cause the Salt Master uh, to shut the Vault uh, thereby cutting off all secure access, so yeah, all your certificates and everything would be invalidated and shut down and uh, stuff like that. Uh, anyway, that's kind of like getting way ahead, way ahead of where we are now. Uh, the main thing is that uh, in our setup, uh, we're going to have uh, two components. Okay, we're going to have the salt master running on server one. Um, it will have a minion running on there, and also, which is the agent uh, in the aforementioned diagram, uh, and we'll have another minion running on server 2. And we will be specifying, using all of this stuff down here, uh, we'll be specifying uh, the configuration. Now, the way uh, salt can... Uh, well, 99% of configuration management systems work the same way. Okay, they are declarative. In other words, the only thing they specify is what must be true on your server for it to comply with the configuration. So, for example, if your configuration management system says this system must have Vim installed, okay. Uh, what it will do is when you say to it, okay, go ahead and make this machine conform to this configuration, it will install Vim uh, if it's not already installed. If it's already installed, it won't do anything at all. Right? So far, so good. What it won't do, though, is it won't make sure, unless you explicitly say this mustn't be installed, it won't install stuff. So uh, it won't uninstall Emacs unless you say, on this machine, Emacs must not be installed. In which case, it will uninstall it if it is installed. And if it isn't installed, it will do nothing. Okay, so, uh, to, uh, and, and this can cause some fairly subtle problems if your mental model isn't right. If, you, if you've got this idea that, uh, so, uh, a good example is this, okay, you, you write your configuration management, so you say, okay, I want Vim installed on these machines, and you then run that and it installs Vim. Okay, then you say, Oh, hang on a minute, no, 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 this machine shouldn't have Vim. So, what you do is you remove that from the configuration of, say, Server 2. And this is where people's mental model gets screwed up because they then run the configuration expecting that Salt will now uninstall Vim. Yeah, it was installed in version 1, it's not installed in version 2. Uh, so, you know, logically you would expect Vim to say, I need to uninstall Vim. No, uh, sorry, uh, Salt to say, uh, I, I need to uninstall Vim. That's not the way it works. Okay, remember, Salt will only, in, uh, only conform to the assertions in your configuration management system. So, 
if in version 1 you said Vim must be installed uh, and it wasn't, Vim will install it. Then you remove it from your configuration and run your configuration again. Now Vim at this point is completely ambivalent about the status of Vim on your system yeah, because your configuration doesn't say anything about it. So Vim will simply say, uh, okay, whatever. It, it won't even bother checking. If, however, you do want to remove Vim from the configuration, what you have to do is explicitly say, instead of saying, well, instead of explicitly saying Vim must be installed, you must say Vim must not be installed. Then when you run your configuration, Vim will say, I'm going to admit, Vim is installed, I will uninstall it. So you see what I'm getting at is, this, the, the, the declarative nature of these configurations means that it will only ever try to make the machine look like what your configuration says at that time. It's got no memory of anything it's done before. Yeah? So if it installed things yesterday and you then remove those installs and run your configuration again, it doesn't remember that it installed these things yesterday and it now needs to uninstall them, put things back the way they were. Yeah? It only makes things conform to a particular configuration. Once you've got that very, very clear in your head uh, and well understood, then the configuration management system becomes a lot easier to use and a lot more uh, intuitive to use. And I think that maybe the most common mistake is that people think that the system has some sort of memory, and it doesn't. Uh, we'll illustrate that. Yeah, it's it's well worth getting that clear in your head. Uh, right. Now there are a few things worth thinking about. Uh, by default, Salt's configuration is specified in YAML. That is the uh, the, the markup. Uh, language uh, YAML, yet another market language, kind of in the name. Um, YAML, well, once you get used to it, that's fine. It's it it it's it, it's okay. Uh, you can get yourself in a bit of a bugger's muddle with it because uh, it relies on indentation for various scoping rules, um, and that can cause difficulties if you're not careful. But it, it's it's not that complicated. And I said by default because um, you can actually use almost any kind of configuration language you like. Uh, some people prefer to specify their salt files using straightforward Python, and that's okay. You can do that. I mean, it's not uh, it's it's not a it's not a problem. I have I told you about doing that? You press the keyboard. When you sleep, yes, it's no good looking at me like that. Okay. I can't have you pressing the keyboard. It causes havoc. Uh, right. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, where was I? Yes. So uh, it, it's up to you, really, and we'll we'll look at the ways of changing it. Uh, for most of the work we do, we'll, we'll use the default um, uh, YAML. Uh, we, we will use, uh, early on, uh, we'll use some tricks about chaining on uh, PGP uh, for keeping secrets uh, and separating those out from the main data. Uh, so you don't end up with, for example, passwords uh, stored anywhere in your system that, that we stored in a secure PGP. Uh, as our system matures, we will actually be using a, a more robust method, which is to use, uh, in this case, we'll use HashiCorp's Vault, uh, and that will store and manage our certificates and all sorts of things in our main infrastructure. Uh, uh, and that will then replace our PGP system. Uh, but uh, it's very important within Salt to understand the difference in scoping for the master and the minion. Uh, the master 
Uh, you, oh, here we go. Uh, something interesting has happened. Uh, server one, right, so we've got the uh, server one was accepted, and then the SSH command with a non zero exit status vacancy, and this means the command failed. Uh, uh, interestingly, Ah, that's not that's not very happy, is it? We got server one, and then it went pear shape. That sucks. That's, uh, right. Remember what I said about the default. Right, so vagrant SSH by default will go into server one. Now server 2 never rebooted, and this didn't reboot either because it never made it past this provisioner. Uh, however, what I'm interested in is salt key list. And we've only got one key. Dun dun dun. Okay. Okay, now we want to go into the server two. Right, the first thing we want to check is did it modify hosts correctly? And ah, that's wrong, isn't it? That should be 253. My configuration file is wrong. Ah, that would explain a great deal. Uh, uh, you know, I would have sworn I'd set this up. Oh, well. I'm going to. Ah. Mm, uh, what should we call this? Central stream and uh, I want to put that the right way around. Uh, looks like it. Cool. So now I can get there straight away by saying go to central stream. Right, okay. Uh, yeah. And the point I was. Uh, actually, uh, uh, yeah, the point I was going to make is uh, again, I'm a dumbass. Uh, that should be three, because it should be the IP address of the master. Uh, that shouldn't have stopped it rebooting, though. But it would certainly have stopped the assault minion from contacting it, so... Uh, so that would explain why the uh, assault minion is not working. Uh, and if we go to assault configuration, you'll see uh, that we don't have uh, we don't have the master uh, in there so if we do the uh, if we edit the and this is just part of our debugging process we're going to rebuild these machines to make sure that we've got it right okay so now that should allow it to connect which means eventually uh, we should get a key, assuming uh, uh, system CTL status of the salt minion. Um, 
Okay. So it should have appeared. Oh, they're not good. It's, it says that it's cached it. Ah, oh, uh, it's just. Okay, so it's cached it where? Um, hmm. So many would wait for ten seconds before attempting to re authenticate. Well, you're not helping the case. Hmm. Okay, so that seems correct. Ah, hang a bit. That should be ourselves, shouldn't it? That should be on the eternal network. Dum, dum, dum. Hmm, okay. Oh, you're just having a funny twenty five seconds. Which is what I expected. Oh. Okay, I'm not sure why it took so long. Right, so now, um, if we now do the and there we see, and we're all connected up now. Now the only remaining mystery is why server two doesn't reload properly. So let's do that now. Uh, Let's just, uh, I can just close that completely. So we reload server two.
and that looks to me like it's fine. Uh, so why doesn't it work? Um, It looks pretty dead. So it looks like the reboot is failing. The question is, is it just a timing issue? Because uh, this machine is somewhat overloaded at the moment. And you haven't said that we're only, I mean we're already running at fifty percent of the capacity of the machine. Isn't it? It's showing that the calls are very busy. Weird. Uh, the, machine's, the machine's busy, but it's not that busy. Oh, there's obviously a problem here with uh, the machine rebooting. So we're going to have to do some investigating. Uh, I have to turn on. Uh, let's have a look at the console. Uh, Server so two. Ah, you see what's happened here. That's what's causing the problem. So why is why is why is grub shitting itself? Uh, what do you know about grub rescue? Anybody? <laughs> uh, right. Okay. Why? Why? Uh, Why is our bootloader getting mangled? Mm. Okay. Mm. Sorry. Mm. Ah. Where? I've lost. Hello, I'm 
I've lost my uh, lost my mouse. Oh, I don't know, but it's uh, yeah, mm. bloody thing. Mm. Mm. Right. So uh, I'm looking at this, and it looks like. Uh, Okay. Uh, uh, mm, so Alice H D zero. Uh, and it's does five and MS DOS mm -hmm. Okay, let's try Okay, so Okay, I'm at a bit of a loss now. I'm expecting to see mm -hmm. no such problem. I know there isn't, is there? Uh, Okay, next is zero comma since this was the only one that got any sense at all. Saying that there's no boot, it is not a boot. Hmm. But why is it getting corrupted? Is the question. I mean, how weird is that? Uh, let's do power off the machine. Hmm. Let's just power that on manually. Grub mm. catalog not found. That's today. It looks like it looks like this is a problem. There's a, there's a faulty part to the update. Mm -hmm. That sucks. The root cause in my case is that I have a RAID 5 built up four disks. Blah, 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 blah. Why? Why would server one be okay and server two be different? I mean, they're they're basically the same thing.
Uh, now, uh -huh. now this is interesting because I remember vaguely reading something on one of the hacker websites. Uh, uh, here we go. I wonder if they've rushed out a fix for this problem. And in so doing, I've buggered up something else. You get the sneaking suspicion that, uh, given in the light of uh, all of these threads, if you look at this, this is today, the 29th, well, the 30th. It, uh, this is like a few hours ago. And by the time it's made it through to uh, the packages, uh, and since Ubuntu is based on Debian, and I'm using Debian, it's very probable that the problem uh, yeah, and if you remember, I had to have had that. Yeah, this is this is this is interesting. Okay, there was a problem. Uh, yeah, do you remember? Do you remember I? Uh, uh, Remember, we had to add uh, in this script, okay, we had to add, uh, not this script, um, uh, in the, uh, in the provisioners server bootstrap script. All right, so in here, we had this line. Uh, And the reason for that was because it was reporting something uh, cockeyed about updating the uh, grub. Uh, so it's actually this upgrade was upgrading the grub bootloader, and now we're having all sorts of problems. So what I'm going to do is temporarily, I'm going to uh, comment out these two lines. Okay, and uh, then ah, destroyed my uh, Okay, and I'm I'm willing to bet that now we're not doing those updates and upgrades because we're not grabbing the latest of anything. This will all work fine. Uh, Do I need to do anything else? Uh, no. Yeah, no, we won't come into the reload. Uh, we don't need to exit that, we just need to do that. Yeah. It's a bit weird why it's only affecting server 2 and not server 1. That's odd. Having said that, uh, having said that, we uh, hit an issue where the accept minion shell was exiting with an error status. Uh, 
And that was meaning we were never getting to the reload of server one. Mm -hmm. Right. So it looks like, uh, and I mean, if this if this builds and reboots too, fine. I'm still kind of expecting an error from server one, but that will be because of the accept minion script. But server one, uh, server two should build and reboot fine now because we're not updating. Uh, sorry, we're not upgrading anything. And the upgrade of the grub bootloader seems to be causing the problem, uh, based on uh, based on these reports here. Uh, it seems. Uh, yeah. There you go. Yeah. yeah. It's the boot hole, which is what this is all going on about. Cool. Okay, so. Okay, so if we were in, if we uh, let's assume we were in a real world situation, yeah, what would we have to do? Uh, ensure the dev config database remembers all the drives that Grub needs to be upgraded on. Please execute our Grub PC to ensure that all the drives you expect to be bootable are listed there. Right. Well, we're going to go through this manually because this is an interesting problem. Yeah, if if this had been on a real infrastructure, okay, and we had done a blanket update and a blanket upgrade, we could have completely fried our entire infrastructure, uh, which would have been very bad. Uh, which is a cautionary note about why you should always test this shit. Uh, Oh, excuse me. Oh, oh dear. Sorry, mate. Mm. There we go. Uh, I've just got the same bug on my Debian SID machine, so it's a global problem with Grub. Uh, I have to downgrade it, works again. Grub 2 was updated to version 204. Updated blah blah blah. Uh, right, so okay, so the story so far is that there's this vulnerability in the Grub bootloader, uh, which has been dubbed boot hole, um, and it is uh, it's to do with. Uh, it, the, the vulnerability allow, in theory, allows someone who's got access to the boot sector on a machine, privileged access to a boot sector on a machine, to basically uh, manipulate the grub bootloader such that it can load anything it likes onto your system, uh, bypassing the um, secure boot uh, system. That's a bad thing. So uh, the issue, uh, so, so it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bad problem. So what they've obviously done is they've made a patched grub to mitigate this. I, I gather from the write-ups, it doesn't solve the problem, but it, it kind of mitigates it. Um, and in doing so, they seem, based on... Based on this stuff, it seems like they've got this grub callop function, okay, uh, and there's there's evidently something screwy either in the packaging or in uh, the original fix that means that the latest grub uh, could end up 
breaking your system now. This depackage reconfigure uh, will configure the grub package uh, uh, ensuring that all the bootable drives are there. Why would that be an issue? I mean, this is pretty serious stuff. This this could this could cause a really big issue if you were. Uh, 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 as you can see, there are one or two. Uh, this is a defect report. Uh, the is in the uh, correct. Uh, uh, so. uh Cool. What's the latest? I mean, oh, this kind of shit's pretty bad. Uh, people being a bit dismissive, saying, oh, well, you know, you're discovering problems. The problem is that we've got a raw install here. You see this? Yeah, sure. This fixes the problem. The problem is that if you've got a system which is effectively a fresh install, here we go. Because you can see here, you know, server two is obviously installed now. Uh, and now we're waiting for server two's key to arrive. And this is going to come down to effectively a race condition. We're going to have to tighten up this except minions setup. Uh, Because uh, it, evidently it's not uh, working quite as smoothly as I'd hoped. Uh, you may need to put some kind of delay. Yeah, this is because it's just timing out. However, if we go to uh, server 2. Oh, come on. Finger trouble, finger trouble. Uh, 
server to Uh, is it working fine? Uh, we'll, have, we'll have a look in a minute. We'll have a look at that, that grub stuff. Um, where are we? Server 2. What was I doing? Come on. Uh, system. CTL status. There we go. So you can see it's it's exited. Uh -huh. Okay, and this is because the salt master is not available in time. So what we want to do is put in a job. Uh, Uh, so if I do that, right? So we got we've got a a, a problem, uh, and it comes down to again this lack of uh, coordination. Uh, what we want to do then is make it so that the salt minion will auto restart, I guess. Or we put some sort of delay into the system. Um, Hmm. Yes. The, the point being that, uh, the, yeah, because the salt minion service is failing, because the salt master is not built yet, uh, and therefore uh, sort of rejects by default uh, because it's not uh, it's not present. Uh, uh, why is it not there yet? Something screwy going on. There is no public key on the salt master. Hmm. And now there is one possibility here, and that is that we're talking to the wrong master that would be a thing um, because 
uh, and, and this is one of those situations I suspect Uh, where I'm, I'm going to bet mm, oh crikey yeah. mm. Maybe it, maybe I'll just use a root account. Okay, how about hmm. Okay, let's do the obvious one. Let's see if it just comes to oh. try that again, except this time spelling vagrant correctly. So it's, it's talking to the right server.
Well, welcome me sideways. I'm guessing that it's uh, because of a mismatch with host names and things. So, uh, this probably needs to precede that. So the only other thing we've got to worry about is the fact that we still have um, uh, I mean the other thing worth noting here is I think uh, sorry we're jumping about a bit today uh, I think that you can define uh, the host name and stuff as part of the setup. Uh, so uh, uh, V name is not relevant. Uh, it's probably going to be under network in internal network. Maybe not. Uh, I thought there was a way of setting the host name stuff here. There, there may be, because we may be able to use uh, VBox Manage. Um, to set the host name stuff, but we don't want to do that because we want to keep it all in the generic scripts so we can run them wherever. Anyway, the long and the short of it is we've now got that certificate in there. So the problem now is the race condition where this uh, server 2 is coming up fine, uh, but uh, the salt, the salt minion is uh, failing because the salt master is just not there, so it's reading it as being a rejection. Maybe. <laughs> okay, let's. Uh, Right, well, while that's cooking, um, let's carry on with our investigation into the problems of this vagrant. Um, right, so what we've got here, secure boot, standardized mechanism, critical panic, blah, 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 almost UAV implementation, ship with the rootkit, belong to Microsoft, uh, root of trust the entire platform, uh, Grub2, is the standard bootloader for most Linux systems. Uh, to avoid having Microsoft re-sign their group bindings every time a modification or update is made for them, Linux vendors use ask Microsoft to sign a much simpler piece of code called the shim bootloader, which is then used to verify and initialize group. Oh, you can always smell the problem now, can you? Uh, using contained certificate control by a Linux distribution, giving its maintainers the freedom to then sign their Grub binaries and other US, uh, OS components with their own certificates that are now part of the chain of trust. Okay. Can we do this? Should we have a uh, Microsoft platform certificate inside? The certificate is used to validate other components. Yeah, but it's only going to validate the shim. So if you can get something between the shim and the full-blown grub. 
Mm. Uh, okay, so research from security firm blah 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 found a buffer overflow loading in the way that Grub2 parses content from its configuration file while the Grub binary is signed, its configuration file is not because it's meant to be editable by the system administration. Like, yeah, uh, okay. For, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. By adding specifically crafted content into the configuration file, the attackers can exploit the vulnerability to execute malicious code in the context of the trusted bootloader. Sure. Okay. Uh, yes. Alright, so such attacks still exist in target systems that don't have secure boot enabled. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Secure boot, not a perfect solution. What is? And the vulnerabilities in certain uh, mm, uh, Group 2 vulnerability. Uh, hmm. A boot kit on a Windows computer with a Secure boot enabled that can replace the Windows boot code over the sign chains on the Linux distribution. <laughs> uh. Okay. Uh. Okay, so the specific details are going to be in this uh, vulnerability report. Uh. Okay, so we've got a few problems. Uh, Now we're doing the server two. Okay, rebooting. Uh, the long and the short of it is you really do want to do this update but if you do it without doing this step you are going to almost certainly bugger up your system um, now the question that we have is why is that necessitated?
And why is it a problem on a completely fresh install? Uh, you know, uh, that's really not a very happy state of affairs. Uh, Actually, that's an interesting point. All of these machines are booted with the BIOS, not with FE at all. Uh, my dev config settings uh, for Grub. Uh, is Grub installed on one partition? Yep. I know from trying to make this would have failed with Grub installed warnings. Uh, X2 does not support embedding. Right, broken enemies on this setup by using block lists. I just didn't spot the error during the upgrade. And the observation completion is really. Oh, upgrade. Okay. Uh -huh. Last update was July 2019, so perhaps we're all discovering problems. That was lately the Debian Ubuntu Grub update process, and the problem is not with really the specific. Right, okay, so. Hmm. On the face, because uh, you wouldn't normally boot from the next to. You'd boot from the MS DOS. Now, showing, showing up as MS DOS in the group, in the Grub. Weird. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, you see, that is what's screwing the pooch. Because you're not being prompted. There, there is actually a prompt. We'll do it in a minute. Yeah. Right, okay, well let's let's take a look, shall we? Mm. Oh. Well, actually server two is up now so we can we can look at that. Okay, so let's do um
my guess is Okay, so we've got the same problem with it timing out. Um, the question is... So it's still showing up as being cached. But it's not actually on this machine, is it? Do you know what? I think the problem actually lies uh, 
Gut. Äh. Delete the publication. This is not master, but it's not there. There is no minion. Uh, or restart the master in open mode to clean out the keys. That doesn't make any sense either. Uh, well, that's probably not true. Uh, all of this stuff is wrong. Well, I mean, it's not wrong, but it doesn't help. Um, Why? It, it hasn't cached it. We can see that. Okay, because over here it, it doesn't appear. It's not under pre, it's not under rejected. Uh, and it says the soul master has rejected this minion's public key. <coughs> Untrue. So, so we evidently have Problem. So where is this minion getting the idea that this master has rejected its key when it's not under rejected or pre over here? Uh, Uh, now that's the other problem. Uh, that's the other problem. If the master's public key is wrong. And there is no public key there. Uh, so. so, what's going on here? Um, mm -hmm. Hmm. 
Right. Here we go. So the master fingerprint could be screwed up. Mm. But we don't have the master public key. Unless it's been cached somewhere. Uh, if it's been cached somewhere, and it's wrong. Okay, let's try this. Um, I'm having a bad day. Okay, uh, so what we'll do is uh, system CTL stops. I think it's actually stopped anyway. And then we'll run it manually. And we're getting nothing there, so. Uh, uh, log and level equals debug. Connecting to master, salt not an IP address, assume it's a host name, blah blah blah. Master URI is da da da, yep, initializing the async, etc. Uh, so da da da, TCP uh, 406 generating random reconnect delay initializing new da 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 connecting them into the master URI which is correct try and connect to da 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 loading public key and then bang Rejection. Hmm. Okay. Hmm. Okay, so that, that would make sense. Uh, I mean, is it loading it over the network? And if so, 
Or is it loading the public key from this end? <laughs> okay, the annoying thing is, I'm pretty sure that if I do a reboot on the server, uh, and then once it's up and running again, do salt minion start that again I'm pretty sure it's gonna work hmm teeny scratch okay so we're up and running again so reading the configuration file Fine. Initializing. Setting. Da, 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 da. Connecting to. Trying to connect to. Oh no, it's rejected it. Okay. Okay, so let's try doing a reboot on the server. Something could be being cached somewhere. Uh, right. Um, okay, so that's what I kind of expected to happen. So the question is, where is the salt minion caching? The problematic information that the salt master has rejected it. Oh, right. So the conclusion is that the salt master does have to be available. And basically, the last machine needs to remotely provoke the master into accepting all the keys. It's a bit crap. Uh, or... Uh, or... We make that script run in the background. Yeah, that may be a better way of doing it. Okay. 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 So. Uh, okay, so here's the thing. Uh, this is obviously causing problems. So let's do it a different way. Uh, the, the absence of the master is obviously causing problems so uh, we take everything in there and move it down to there Oops. Uh, down to there okay uh, but now we have the problem that this script which needs to run on server one. Uh, okay. Uh, now I wonder if I can be sneaky sneaky. And if I add that, will that push it into the background? Uh, probably not because it's going to run. Uh, that'll, uh, it should detach it. 
Hmm. But if it quotes it, then we it screws the pooch. Okay, so rather than run that directly, what we're going to do is upload it. Uh, and then explicitly run the one on the machine, putting it into the background. And then that script needs to continually check uh, the acceptance of the keys. Uh, when it, it, uh, do you know what? I'm rapidly coming to the idea that we just accept the keys manually. Uh, we're probably making our lives too difficult. Because we, the first thing we're going to do is interact with these machines anyway. So let's get rid of. Okay. Oh, okay, you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about. Okay, it, it's it's kind of cute to have the keys accepted as part of this process, but also kind of irrelevant uh, because the very first thing we're going to want to do is then interact with Salt to get the configuration on. Yes, it would be nice if uh, if the okay if we want to automate completely the process of the initial configuration of these machines uh, then uh, we need to do the key acceptance and then we need to run the high state but you might as well do that all in a kind of side issue which we can load onto the master and it can run independently uh, because the conditions are different then because you're going to loop and accept the keys and once you've accepted all of the keys you expect then you would step on and assert the salt state uh, or run the orchestration or whatever you wanted to run yeah? so it, it's a different problem if you want to automate to that extent if you don't want to automate to that extent then you might as well say well okay we can accept the keys manually and then we'll run the configuration manually as well so here's what i'm going to do i'm going to change this so that uh, what will happen is the master will actually upload and run a different system uh, uh, and it will be a whole series of shell scripts that will automate the acceptance of the keys and then the recognition of once we've accepted certain keys we can run parts of the orchestration uh, and that will allow us to continue the sort of automation theme throughout the entire system for the initial setup uh, and will avoid the problem we're having here because it's a different approach right so what we're going to do instead is on this server after it's rebooted because it really doesn't matter beforehand is we're going to do a provision uh, and what we're provisioning in this case is uh, we're actually going to provision a file uh, uh, I think you just do uh, see this is how shitty my memory is we, we only did this the other day and uh, I'm already forgetting uh, so we're going to provision uh, uh, is it, uh, it's source and destination isn't it uh, dot slash uh, provisioners master uh, uh, and we might as well make it all of them. So it's provisions master quote and the destination. And I'll, I'll sort these out in a minute because uh, I'm, I'm sure that there's something like this. 
uh, will be slash temp slash provisioners uh, okay so that does all the copying and then we will run the dm dot provision and, and we're running that and the command we're going to run is temp slash provisioners slash main and we're going to run that in the background because it's going to just exit yeah. uh, unless uh, the vagrant provides a way of doing that more gracefully uh, which is okay let's just check that we've got this right uh, okay so i'm going to spell it in full uh, um, Uh, right, so source and destination uh, and shell inline. Uh, just make sure Earth of body and keep going over PowerShell, PowerShell privileged. Uh, Defaults to true. Uh, That's an interesting point, actually. Uh, I'm currently using that reboot, sorry, the reload. Uh, it's probably better to use this uh, to reboot the guest. Um, because reload, uh, I believe, is no longer a supported extension. Uh, anyway, vagrant reload. I oh, know it's time for your dinner, isn't it, mate? Um, I have a suspicion that. I think uh, I th I've got a feeling that this has been superseded now by this facility. Uh, we might try that later. Um, but for now, no, the reload plugin is working fine. So. But it would mean one, one less, one less plugin for people to install in order to use this. Uh, we could just get rid of it uh, and just use the shell reboot. Um, what did you say about doing the reboot? Uh, I say reboot true, doesn't it? Just, uh, just does a reboot, I assume. Uh, Mm. Okay, well, anyway. Uh, right, so yeah, so what we need to do then is uh, we need to. Oops, uh, um, uh, we now need that main, okay? So for now, we'll just put our dummy in there. Uh, 
version is master or main. Okay, so we'll just put we'll just put a dummy in there. Before you get it, uh, now then, uh, so this is going to be uh, essentially our top level orchestration, but we're going to use salt orchestration in this. But what we want to do is we want to be able to take lists of servers. Um, and when that list is available, we want to be able to run a particular series of orchestration, which will then install bits and bobs. Right? Now at the moment it's dead simple because we've only got the two servers. Uh, but if we had six or seven or ten servers, uh, we'd want this orchestration to be a bit more complicated. Um, now you've got two choices. You either wait for all of the servers to be available and then run a series of orchestrations to configure the rest of the system, or you're a bit more clever about it and you make each series of orchestration uh, contingent on the availability of a subset of servers. And that's a much neater solution, uh, but requires some thinking about. Yeah, anyway. Uh, the point is, uh, we don't need to worry about that right now. Uh, let's just make sure we haven't screwed the pooch. Uh, oh, actually, mm. ah, good. I'm, I'm glad about that. Uh, well, I'm not not glad, glad. Uh, Uh, I'm, I'm glad it didn't work because it means I can check out a few things. I don't need to do that, don't I? Just do that. Because uh, what I'm interested in doing is investigating how uh, how to fix this problem with the grub loader. So, uh, so it's saying. We should run dpackage reconfigure. Uh, grub. Uh, let me see. Let's extracted from etc. Default grub. Uh, okay. Ah, now this is where it's getting it wrong. It was previously installed to a disk that is no longer present. Weird. It would be helpful. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's where it should be installed uh, under SDA1. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it's over there on this one because it is, uh, yeah. Uh, 
And that, that's, uh, okay, that explains the MSD, MS-DOS 1 and MS-DOS 5. It's just taking the device names. That's very strange. Why? So where the hell is he getting that information from? Um, This is one step up anyway. It's going to be buried somewhere. Uh, Okay, how about show uh, grub drives? Uh, how do I list my devices in grub? Uh, And this is just what we've seen before. Uh, I don't want to use grub per se. What I want to do is check the configuration. Uh, default bootloader. I mean, I can I can see how to install it, but what I want to know. Ooh. 
Mm. Okay, how old is this? Um uh, show current group config. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Based operating system, download mm. Mm. Oof. Extract the tarball. Oh, so I assume it's tar juice it then. Okay. Grab two. Right, it looks four. Interesting. Oh. 
point it's got the right Get it right. Well, he's got it right. He's got the right drive. And it looks at sector one with the same hard drive. For the core image. Uh, and core image is that location looks for position 1084. Uh, oh, that's interesting. Or dot. And what the fuck does that mean? Uh, Partition and info. The files loaded by Grub. SDA1. Uh, so everything's fine and funky. Alright, so if I do, and I know this is going to break it. Huh? Get. Update. Right, let's do that. Get upgrade. Uh, now, we don't have the Debian front end, so it should prompt us. Well, I think it's just going to run that. It's just going to run the Grub PC to change the configuration to confirm the drive. However, what we can then do is run that script again and see what the hell the difference is between the results. Because it's weird. It was a bit naughty of me to download that into the boot drive as well. <laughs> oh. Shouldn't do that because <laughs> uh, it's uh, now then. Uh, there we go. Setting up good PC PC pin. Uh, well, it's not. It's not complained about anything. So uh, let's go back to yeah. Run the boot info script again. Okay, so it's now in results two. So if we now diff results one with results two, so what have we got? Okay, well, we expected that, albeit uh, uh, okay, so there's no difference. It suggests to me, because if I now exit that and exit that and then 
vagrant reload. I think she had the reload server one. Break it. Mm -hmm. All right, so this is where we got to last time, and it had gone into. Ah, well, that's... So we're now looking at the console. And that's booted fine. Oh, it's giving me a migraine, Kenny. So why does that work? And unless. <laughs> There's been a, a recent drop and there's been a fix put in. Possible. It's possible. It's possible, or it could be something to do with having rebooted it once. Uh, I don't know. I'm slightly mystified now, mate. Okay, let's try this. Mm. Vagrant destroy. Uh, now we've got our new sexy stuff down here. So okay, let's let's test it as is. Uh, that's got the the update and the upgrade are disabled in the script at the moment. So all we're going to be testing at the moment is and we haven't screwed anything up by doing this. Uh, uh, I suppose actually I should uh, okay let's um uh, let's just put something in here that is absolutely ridiculous. Let's sleep for ten thousand seconds. Uh, all that means is that the script will block the ampersand should put it in the background and hopefully it won't interfere oh, why did I do that uh, hopefully it won't interfere with our build process because mm, it should be detached Oh, having said that, uh, does it detach completely? And does it become part of the process tree? Uh, I think it detaches completely. Oh, seriously. This is when we're getting old, Kenny. You forget this shit. Um, okay, the boot info script was good, but ultimately not as helpful as I would have hoped. Uh, that is, although we know what the problem is, it is proving a bit of a bastard to nail down. You getting hungry, little man? Mm, is that why you're all fidgety? You want some food? Right, I'll tell you what, we'll take a quick little break uh, and then we'll resume when, uh, when we fed you. <laughs> 